Hello everyone, welcome to the tutorial on data democratization with deep learning. We are going to talk about text to SQL systems, why we need them and what they are about. So this tutorial is going to be presented by me, Georgia Kutrika and George Katsoyanis. We are going to walk you through the text to SQL systems landscape. And at the end of the tutorial, we are going to uh, answer any questions that are, uh, that are uh, there. So first of all, uh, let's discuss why we need text to SQL systems. Nowadays, many different data sets are being generated by users, systems, devices, sensors, and so forth. And these data are used in many different uh, activities, like um, uh, looking for insights, patterns, information, and these data repositories can benefit many different types of users, from scientists to uh, sales uh, pers people, from uh, citizens to meteorologists, doctors, and so forth. However, despite the opportunities that this data uh, generate, not all users actually have equal access to data. And uh, the reasons for this are essentially twofold. First of all, the uh, uh, databases nowadays are very complex. They contain many different data. They have a lot of attributes, a lot of uh, tables, and essentially the volume and the complexity of data make it really hard to query data. On the other hand, data query interfaces are also notoriously not user-friendly. On one hand, we have form-based interfaces that are meant to be easy to use, However, they have limited query capabilities. On the other hand, low-level query interfaces are mostly intended for programmers that know the database schema, and they also know how to query in the underlying uh, language, for example, in SQL or other query or programming languages. So essentially, the data volume and complexity, but also the uh, the complexities and the limitations of existing database query interfaces make it really hard for most users to access the data in, um, in a way that is easy for them. So essentially, that brings us to the vision and the need also for data democratization. What is data democratization? It is essentially the need to empower every user to access, use, understand, and leverage data. And in order to do this, essentially, we need to lift the technical barriers that impede access to data and essentially eliminate dependency on IT experts that up to this point, essentially, in most cases, they stand between the users that want to access the data and the data. And for this, we need to design to develop tools that are aimed for the casual user. Being able to ask queries in natural language can essentially open up data access to everyone. And uh, this need was uh, actually uh, foreseen and predicted uh, many, many years ago by uh, Ted Code that essentially said that if we want to satisfy the needs of casual users, we must enable them to, we must enable them to be able to ask their questions using their native languages. So let's talk about the text to SQL problem. Essentially, uh, if we have a database like the example that we see here, we want, to see, we want the system to be able to understand questions that the user poses using natural language. For example, here, the user asks which cities have year round average temperature above 50 degrees. The system is able to understand that this question should be translated in the SQL query that we see here, this is a language that the system understands, not the user. The, the system understands this uh, query, executes a query, and returns the results back to the user. So essentially, using this uh, translation capability, the user is completely sealed by, uh, from the uh, intricacies of the underlying system. And the user is able to ask whatever questions they want to ask, in, uh, in natural language. However, the text to SQL problem is uh, the most challenging problem. From the natural language side, we are uh, dealing with uh, the ambiguity that comes with uh, natural language. For example, when we ask even a simple question like show information about Paris, uh, 
do we mean uh, the city or do we mean the person? Or when we say, show me information about the model, do we refer to the car model or the engine model that both and both these attributes actually exist in our underlying database? Other complications like when uh, the question that we ask implies some information that is not uh, obvious in the query. For example, when we uh, query about presidents before Obama, the, uh, the information about the US president is not in the query per se, but is actually implied. And the system now is required to understand this type of uh, missing uh, information. Uh, many other challenges that the natural language essentially poses. And on top of that, we have user mistakes, for example, spelling mistakes, or even syntactical and grammatical mistakes that make the problem even more complicated. Now, translating the, uh, the, natural, uh, que the natural query uh, into uh, SQL also bears a lot of problems from the SQL side now. First of all, SQL is a query language, a system query language that has a very strict grammar and limited expressivity. And essentially that creates problems such as dealing with um, natural language questions that are very simple to, to, to express and understand. But when such questions need to be translated into an SQL query, this query may be uh, very complicated, having, for example, nesting and other SQL constructs that make the, the that are needed. Uh, the other complication here has to do with how the data is uh, structured and organized in the day in the database, essentially the database schema, and how this may be quite different from the user's data model. For example, when the user asks about directors who released the movie this year, and um, this may need actually to combine information from several different underlying tables. And this is something that the user, of course, does not know and does not need of to, to know. Now, in the last few years, we have seen many different systems that use deep learning techniques. And uh, this is why we are focusing on this in this uh, tutorial. But these systems were made possible with the emergence of uh, benchmarks, of query benchmarks that allowed the systems to train and also to test their performance. So if we take a look at the query benchmarks uh, from many years, we see that um, in the past, there are several different uh, data sets, for example, ATIS and GeoQuery that, that are, uh, that are uh, developed back in 1994 and 1996. But the problem with, um, uh, with earlier uh, evaluations and earlier systems were, was that they did not use common data sets. Essentially, different systems would use different data sets of varying size and complexity. This created a huge problem because essentially we could not compare different systems based on their performance since they use different benchmarks. The second problem is that most of these early benchmarks, as you can observe in the, in the table on the slide, used the very, uh, very few query examples. For example, Addis that we uh, mentioned already used only uh, around 300 uh, queries. And of course, such small uh, query benchmarks did not allow deep learning techniques to be uh, implemented and developed. Now, the landscape changes in uh, 2017, with the uh, appearance of WikiSQL, the first large uh, query set, and a year later, we see Spider. So we are going to focus on these two benchmarks because they really revolution, they really change the, uh, the textual um, landscape, and they allowed the development of deep learning techniques for this uh, purpose. Now, WikiSQL was a, is a large uh, crowdsourced uh, data set. It contains around 80,000 uh, NL to SQL pairs. And uh, these uh, queries are expressed over tables that are extracted from Wikipedia. So essentially here we see two limitations that WikiSQL already has. It uh, has queries that are expressed only over single tables, not entire databases. And uh, since it was crowdsourced, and uh, the information was extracted from Wikipedia tables, it also contains many uh, mistakes. So let's see an example 
of how WikiSQL, NL2SQL per, uh, looks like. So here we see a table that was extracted from Wikipedia containing information about uh, Toronto Raptors. And uh, we see an example of NL, of, uh, NL questions, what nationality is the player Maxi Box, and how this um, uh, query is translated into SQL. Now, this is a good example, but as we already mentioned, WikiSQL also has some bad examples. And here is one of them. So we have this Wikipedia table here that talks about uh, different countries. And uh, this table was, uh, um, uh, was badly copied in WikiSQL. So we see here how the table looks like in WikiSQL. It doesn't make a lot of sense. And as a result of that, the NL queries and SQL queries that were generated on top of this table also did not make sense. So here we have an example of uh, an NL query and an SQL query, a pair of queries that, uh, that do not make sense and they are not useful for training or for testing any system. Now, SPIDER, on the other hand, uh, has um, uh, the, the characteristic that it contains fewer questions, but still a lot. So we are talking about 10,000 questions here. And, uh, but now we are talking about 200 databases. So we don't deal with the single tables anymore, but SPIDER allows queries over um, multiple table databases. And it is a much cleaner data set because it was annotated by a small group of, uh, of people. And they created queries that were divided into four uh, large categories based on the difficulty of the SQL query from easy to extra hard. So essentially SPIDER has better quality, but also has higher complexity than WikiSQL. And it is the benchmark that is mostly used in the last uh, couple of years by all deep learning text to SQL systems. So here we see an example of how these queries look like, an easy one and uh, all the way to an extra hard one. And as you can see, essentially the complexity of the SQL query characterizes whether this query is easy or extra hard. So at this point, I am going to give the floor to, to George and he's going to walk us through the taxonomy of a text to SQL deep learning systems. George, we cannot hear you. Okay, so can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, so as I was saying, uh, now that we have a good grasp of the problem and the available benchmarks, we're going to present uh, a taxonomy of text to SQL deep learning systems. And we're going to start from uh, the inputs that the system accepts. And we're going to go through all the important uh, steps and all the important design decisions uh, that need to be taken uh, to create uh, such a system. The first uh, dimension we're going to see is schema linking. Uh, so essentially what is schema linking? Uh, it is the problem of finding connections between the natural language question and the database. And it is helpful to consider uh, a human that wants to write an SQL query based on a natural language specification. One of the first steps that a human would perform is to try and find out how the words that appear in the natural language question uh, are expressed in the database. So here we have an example. Uh, and in this case, we see that the word heads in the question is actually 
uh, expressed as a table in the database. So we could say that uh, this part of the MLQ is a, a table link to the table head uh, in the database schema. And we can differentiate between three types uh, of schema links, uh, depending on the, on the type uh, of uh, database entity that they refer to. We can have table links that refer to tables, column links that refer to columns, and value links uh, that refer to values that are present under a certain column in the database. So in this example, the number 56 uh, is also a schema link, and it is a value link to the column age in the table head. Uh, we can also see that there are words such as uh, departments uh, that uh, someone could say is a table link to the table department. But uh, as we see, this schema link does not help us create the correct uh, SQL query that corresponds to the user's intention. Similarly, the number 56 could also be found as a value uh, under an ID column. But these are links that do not help us create the SQL, so it is not enough to only find uh, schema links. We must also create a system that understands which schema links are uh, useful and important to create the SQL. So there are three main questions uh, about schema linking. The first one is which parts of the natural language question to consider. Uh, the second one is which parts of the database to consider. So here we see that we have uh, query candidates from one side and database candidates from the other side. And the third important question is when we have candidates from both sides, how do we decide if there's a match between them and if, they, if there is a schema link between them? So starting from query candidates, uh, there are four main techniques that are used to uh, identify them. The first one and uh, the simplest one is to consider every single token, uh, every single word essentially in the NLQ. And in the examples that we have here on the right, uh, this technique can help us find uh, query candidates such as department that is only a single word, but uh, very often we will have query candidates that span over multiple words. And in this case, we also need to consider engrams, so essentially phrases of uh, multiple tokens. And this will be usually of varying length. It could be two words, three words, uh, maybe six or seven, depending on the example. And there are also uh, more sophisticated ways uh, to find query candidates, such as named entity recognition, uh, which in this example could help us find uh, New York. Uh, and named entity recognition is uh, very good at finding uh, value links, usually. However, we can also consider the case where New York is not stored exactly in the same way in the database. Maybe uh, the database only contains the acronym NY. So in this case, uh, a system called ValueNet proposes a more intricate uh, way of, of generating additional candidates. So what ValueNet proposes is that we start by performing named entity recognition. And based on the results of named entity recognition, we can generate additional candidates. And we do so by looking up similar values in the database or other knowledge bases, and also performing string manipulation on these uh, uh, candidates. And by doing so, on New York, we can generate additional candidates such as NY, uh, NY with dots, and so on. And in this case, we have generated the candidate exactly as it appears in the database. Now, moving on to database candidates, uh, we have essentially three large categories. The first is tables, the second is columns, and the, and the third is values. Now, when it comes to tables and columns, uh, our job is uh, actually 
very straightforward. We can just uh, go through all the table names and all the column names uh, and consider these as database candidates because usually uh, they're not that many and it uh, wouldn't be too expensive to look through all of them. However, when it comes to values, we need uh, a more efficient method uh, due to the sheer size of the data that can be stored uh, inside the database. Uh, a very common method is to use uh, database structures like inverted indices that uh, greatly reduce the cost of looking up uh, a value in the database. Uh, but there is also uh, the special case where we might not have access to the underlying data, maybe due to privacy issues. So in this case, a system called IronNet proposes a very interesting uh, technique where we can search candidates that we believe that uh, are referring to values inside the database in external knowledge graphs. So let's consider the case where we have New York. Uh, we don't have access to the data inside the database, but we can search New York in a knowledge graph like ConceptNet. And in ConceptNet, we would find that New York is actually a state. So uh, we can match the word state to the column born state in uh, the database schema. And that would tell us that New York is actually a value link to the column born state. So now that we have found uh, both our query candidates and our database candidates, we need to find uh, a technique, uh, a match method to decide if there's a link between them. The most simple methods are the exact match and partial match methods, where an exact match happens if the two candidates are identical, and a partial match happens if uh, a part of one candidate appears uh, inside the other candidate. Uh, however, our work is not always this simple. Uh, another, another technique is called fuzzy string matching, where we use string manipulation techniques. And uh, this match method helps us find, help us find a uh, match where we have different spelling or maybe some uh, letters of one word uh, are missing. And this could help us match uh, the abbreviation of department to the whole word. However, uh, most of the time, uh, the user does not use the exact same vocabulary as it is used in the database schema. So in this last example, we have to match department director to the word head. And this is something that traditional match methods uh, cannot achieve. In this case, we must look into more intelligent uh, techniques and maybe consider uh, learned word embeddings or even classifiers. And uh, maybe we could also, we could even train a neural network to find uh, hard links like this one. So uh, we talked about schema linking. The next step, now that we have uh, our input and we have discovered some links in our input, uh, is how we're going to process natural language and how we're going to give natural language to uh, our neural network, because neural networks cannot accept uh, text, they can only accept numerical inputs. Uh, the go-to method for processing natural language until recently is by using uh, word embeddings and recurrent neural networks like an LSTM network. However, since the introduction of the transformer architecture, uh, we're currently living in the era of language models, which are currently dominating uh, almost every natural language processing task. I'm sure you have heard of models like BERT. Uh, and uh, every year and every month, we're seeing uh, newer and improved models and even models that are designed specifically uh, for tasks like the uh, text to SQL task. And these, we could say, are encoder-only models. And we'll see more about this later on. And we're also seeing a new family of encoder-decoder models, such as BART and T5, uh, which are a bit different in the way we use them, but are also very powerful, as we see 
as we will see in a few moments. So how would we go about using uh, word embeddings? Uh, essentially, we uh, would assign uh, a word embedding vector to every word in our input. Uh, and here we, we face one of the first problems of using word embeddings because we have a pre-trained set of word vectors it is very possible and uh, uh, very usual to have some words, some rare words uh, like names and so on that would not have an embedding representation uh, just because uh, it is not possible to store an, a vector for every word in the universe that would need a lot of memory. Uh, so we would assign a vector for every word and we would get a sequence of embedding vectors that we would give to a recurrent neural network, most often to an LSTM network. And the network would process this input sequence and it would create a hidden representation of our input that could then be used by the rest of the system to make predictions. Uh, here we also have two major drawbacks uh, due to the use of RNNs. The first one is that the processing cost uh, get uh, very high very quickly when we have long sequences uh, and it is uh, very costly to train such a model. And the second one is that RNNs uh, are not that uh, robust in making associations of words that are not near each other in the sequence. So if we have uh, a word in the beginning of the sentence that refers to a word that is found at the end of the sentence, it is uh, possible that by the time our network reaches at the end of the sentence, it has already forgotten uh, the first words. Now, uh, as I said, we're living in the era of pre-trained language models. And uh, what are pre-trained language models? Essentially, they're very large uh, neural networks. Uh, here we have the example of BERT that has multiple variations of 110 million parameters, 340 million parameters but there are even larger uh, models that can have up to uh, 3 billion parameters or more. And these networks uh, are pre-trained on generic natural language tasks and can then be applied on a wide variety of downstream natural language tasks, such as the text to SQL problem. And uh, experimental results show that their performance uh, is usually state of the art uh, beating previous uh, methods. Uh, these models are based on the transformer neural architecture, which uh, solves two of the problems that I mentioned earlier. First of all, each element of the, of the sequence is processed simultaneously and not recurrently, uh, which greatly decreases computation costs and it allows us to process uh, larger and larger sequences of texts. And the second benefit is that all outputs are based on all the input elements of the sequence, thanks to the attention uh, networks that uh, create these transformer architectures, uh, which means that no matter how far two words uh, are from each other in the input, uh, if there is an association between them, transformers are able to find these associations much better uh, than uh, recurrent neural networks. Another benefit is that uh, these models use word piece embedding that, help us, uh, that help us eliminate the out of vocabulary problem. So here we have an example with uh, glove embeddings, but this would be true for uh, most uh, word uh, embedding algorithms where glove is unable to find, uh, it does not have actually uh, a pre-trained vector for these rare words. But what word piece does is that it can break down unknown words into smaller uh, subwords that it has representations for. So it can uh, effectively find a representation for any word that we give it. So a few words about BERT's architecture, but this is true for almost all encoder-only uh, models. Uh, it takes as input a sequence of token embeddings, uh, 
world peace embeddings, as we just uh, talked about. It uses many stacks of bidirectional uh, transformer layers to encode this input, and it returns an output of contextualized uh, embeddings. Uh, essentially, this is a contextualized representation of our input that we can then uh, give to the rest of the network to make predictions. Now, notice here that this is the encoder-only architecture that uh, I was talking about. And the main feature here is that what we get is a contextualized representation that uh, will be given to some other neural network to make predictions. So uh, a few words about BERT, but this also applies to most pre-trained language models. Uh, there are two parts uh, in uh, BERT's use. The first part is the pre-training uh, stage, uh, where we use a very, very large training corpus, uh, and we simultaneously pre-train it on two, uh, let's say, more generic natural language tasks that help it uh, get a good understanding of how natural language works uh, and how uh, it is phrased and so on. These two tasks are called the mask language modeling task, where it predicts, uh, where we mask out certain words from input, and BERT has to find out which words are missing. And the second task is the next sentence prediction task, uh, where we give it two, two sentences, and it has to find out if these two sentences could appear next to each other uh, in, a, in a larger text. So these tasks give it a good understanding of how natural language works. We get the pre-trained model, and then we can fine tune it. Uh, so essentially, we apply it on the task that we want to solve. And this is a, an application of transfer learning. Uh, and we, we, we add a few extra layers uh, that process these contextualized embeddings and make predictions for our tasks. And we must make two decisions in order to use BERT. We must decide how we're going to structure our input and how we're going to give it to BERT and how we're going to use BERT's output to make predictions for our task. Now, similarly to BERT, there are task-specific uh, language models uh, that are being released and are being shown to be, to be more promising uh, for tasks like the text to SQL problem. Uh, one such model is called GRAPA. Uh, its architecture is very similar to BERT. The big difference is here is the data sets that it is pre-trained on. And as you see, it uses data sets that contain structured and tabular data like SPIDER and WikiSQL, and the pre-training tasks that are performed to pre-train it. Uh, here we have uh, the mask language model modeling task once again, but in this case, it is not performed on simple sentences. It is performed on natural language queries and tables. And we also have the SQL semantic prediction task where we give the model a natural language question and the columns of the table, and we ask the network to predict what function each of the columns would have in the corresponding SQL query. So would they be used in the select statement, in the group by statement, and so on. And finally, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have two big categories of pre-trained language model. The first one is encoder only, and the second one is uh, encoder-decoder architecture. And essentially, here, this left part would be uh, BERT, and it produces a contextualized representation. And encoder-decoder models also have uh, a decoder part that accepts this contextualized representation, and it produces an output sequence. So we could say that encoder-decoder models operate on a sequence-to-sequence -sequence framework. They accept the sequence, and they return a sequence. And both these sequences are text. So it's a text-to-text -text framework. So you could imagine that uh, if we have such a model, we could give the natural language question and information about the database as an input, and it would directly return the SQL as an output. Now, our design choices in this case are very limited because it is not 
easy and usually it is not efficient to intervene in the architecture of the model. Uh, however, uh, experimental results show that these models could actually uh, achieve very good performance. And in some cases, they have uh, surpassed encoder-only models, as we will see later on. So uh, we have talked about how we pre-process our inputs, how we're going to represent natural language. Uh, the next part is uh, the dimension of input encoding, which examines how we're going to structure our input and how the network will uh, uh, accept the input and how it will be encoded. Uh, we have four dimensions here for, for different choices. The first one is the separate encoding option, which was used by the first text to SQL systems that uh, uh, worked mainly uh, for wiki SQL. So keep in mind that we have single tables here and not full relational databases. And we have two separate encoders. One uh, accepts the natural language question and the other one accepts the column names of the table. Uh, the big different, the big, uh, the main reason that we use two separate encoders is the different format of the two inputs, where the natural language question is just a sentence, so it's a sequence of words. Uh, the column names are multiple sentences, so it's a sequence of sequences of words. Now. Uh, the main point uh, when we use this type of input encoding is that at some point these two uh, input streams need to be combi combined so we can make a prediction based on both of them. And to do so, we either use some attention mechanism, concatenation, and so on. Uh, this option is not used that often uh, nowadays, and it was only used by the first systems. The second input encoding uh, option is uh, the serialization option. It is very widely used uh, by newer systems that use uh, some sort of language model. And what we do in this case is that we serialize uh, all of our inputs into a single sequence. So as you see in this example, uh, we have a sequence that starts with the natural language query. Uh, we have a separating token. And then we have the table names and the column names, and all of them are separated with special uh, tokens. Uh, this is very useful because it can be used with pre-trained language models. Uh, there's no need to combine two different inputs later on. Uh, but the big disadvantage in this case is that we are flattening the database schema into a sequence. So it is not very easy. It is not straightforward. Uh, to understand which words here are table names and which words here are column names. And also, uh, we do not have any information about relations between tables like primary and foreign keys and so on. Uh, now we're going to see a very special case uh, that was uh, proposed by a system called Hydronet, and it was not used uh, again, by any other system. Uh, what Hydranet does, uh, first of all, it works on the WikiSQL benchmark. And what it does is that it processes each column of the table uh, separately with the NLQ. So what it does is it makes predictions for each column independently of the rest of the columns. Uh, now, on one hand, we could say that this approach uh, does not allow the model to get a full picture of all the columns of the table. However, uh, results show that it actually achieves very good uh, accuracy on the WikiSQL benchmark. However, uh, there is no clear way uh, of how this could be extended to a full relational database. And as of now, there is no similar approach for the SPIDER benchmark. Finally, uh, we have the option of graph encoding. Uh, and even though it is not used that often, it is very promising because if, if we use a graph to represent uh, our input, uh, 
we can actually preserve all the schema relations uh, that appear in the database schema. Uh, we can explicitly show which columns belong to which tables. Uh, we can show which columns are primary and foreign keys and which uh, columns and tables are connected by key relationships. We can also add the words of the NLQ as nodes in our, uh, in our graph. And we can also indicate discovered schema links between, uh, for example, a word in the query in the natural language question and a table uh, in the database schema. Now, even though this allows us to preserve all the information that we have, uh, it needs a much more complex neural design. And uh, this is the reason why it has not seen uh, that widespread use uh, so far. So now that we have created our inputs, we have processed it, uh, we're going to examine uh, three big categories of how uh, a network can decode the output and how a network can make predictions of SQL queries. The first category is sequence-based decoders, where essentially we consider two sequences. Uh, the input sequence is the NLQ and maybe information about the database, and the output sequence is the SQL query. So the text to SQL problem become, becomes a sequence-to-sequence -sequence translation problem, uh, which allows us to use uh, widespread uh, architectures of neural networks uh, and the network simply learns to generate a sequence of words, which is the uh, SQL query. And while this approach greatly simplifies the text to SQL problem, uh, it opens a lot of possibilities for errors because during prediction time, nothing prevents the network from creating uh, syntactically and grammatically incorrect queries. And for this reason, uh, this approach was not used for uh, a long time until recently. However, recent works uh, show promising techniques that can help us uh, restrain the sequence-based decoder and uh, help it avoid such errors, uh, which might signify that it, they might be stronger than we thought. And we will talk about this uh, a bit more later on. The second category of uh, uh, output decoding uh, is sketch-based decoders, where we consider a sketch of the SQL query that has some missing parts, some missing slots that need to be filled. Uh, and when we fill these slots, uh, we end up with uh, an SQL query. Uh, some of the advantages here is that this approach further simplifies the task and it divides it into smaller and easier subtasks. So instead of predicting the entire query, uh, we first have to just predict which aggregation function we're going to use, and then we predict which column will appear here out of all the available columns. Uh, and it also guarantees us that we will not have any grammatical errors because we're following a predefined sketch that is always going to be grammatically correct. However, the big disadvantage here is that this approach is very, very hard to extend for uh, more complex queries. And uh, in fact, there is no uh, good way to create uh, SQL queries for extended relational databases using sketches, because we cannot create a sketch that covers every possible uh, SQL query that might contain joins, it might contain nested queries, and so on. Uh, the final uh, option for output decoding is grammar-based uh, decoders. Uh, and what they do is that they generate a sequence, uh, but, in, but this time they generate a sequence of rules and not just simple tokens. And by applying these uh, uh, grammar rules uh, sequentially, we can generate an SQL query. And exactly because we are basing 
uh, our decoder on a predefined grammar, uh, it is much easier to avoid errors because uh, we're just applying rules. There's no a possibility to create something that is not grammatically correct. And at the same time, this allows us to cover much more complex queries. And in fact, this is the go-to uh, method if we want to create a system that can cover complex SQL queries over uh, complete relational databases. The disadvantage here is that uh, creating a decoder that generates grammar rules is a bit more complex process. So we need to uh, consider our design options uh, a bit more. So we have, so far we have considered uh, all the process starting from the inputs, how we uh, pre-process them, how we represent them, how we uh, accept the inputs and how we produce the outputs. There are two uh, additional dimensions that we would like to mention. Uh, the first one is the neural training dimension. Uh, and because exactly we're working with neural networks, we must also consider the way that they are trained. Uh, obviously, the simplest and most common approach is to create the network, initialize it, and start training it from scratch uh, on the data set that we have, whether that is WikiSQL or Spider. And uh, this uh, was done. Uh, most commonly uh, for the first models, uh, first text to SQL models. But since the introduction of pre trained language models like BERT, uh, what we see uh, more and more often uh, is the transfer learning uh, training paradigm, where we have a pre trained model like BERT, and uh, it is pre trained on a generic uh, natural language task, and then we fine tune it for the text to SQL task and we benefit from its, uh, from its generic uh, knowledge. And uh, they have proven to be very powerful. And uh, up to this day, it is the go-to technique because of their uh, boost in performance. There are also two uh, additional categories that uh, we like to mention. The first one is that we can also introduce uh, additional objectives when we're training uh, our system. So uh, what we're talking about is essentially some uh, subtasks that are closely related to the text to SQL problem. Uh, and by training our model on multiple tasks simultaneously, we help it uh, achieve better generalization and even uh, better performance, as uh, a system called SEED uh, shows us. And it actually proposes two very interesting uh, tasks that are related to the text to SQL problem uh, that I will not go through right now because uh, of lack of time. Uh, a final uh, idea in the training of a text to SQL uh, neural model is that we can also pre-train specific parts of the, of the system uh, because maybe these, these uh, components of the system can actually benefit by training uh, before we start training the, the whole of the system. And uh, GP proposes that we could, for example, pre-train the decoder of the model so that it gets uh, a good idea of how the, the output that it must produce is uh, shaped. So for example, it uh, must uh, understand that SQL queries usually start with the select clause, and then uh, we have some columns, and then we have the from clause, uh, and so on. And the final dimension uh, we're going to talk about is the dimension of output refinement. So uh, we have designed our system from uh, its input up until its output. We have trained our system. Uh, and now the output, refining, output refinement dimension uh, proposes some refinement techniques that can be applied to the system 
uh, without intervening into its architecture and they can, uh, as we will see, uh, increase uh, its accuracy and boost its performance. Uh, the first output refinement technique is called execution guided decoding. It can be, it can be applied to systems that use sketch-based decoders and it can help greatly reduce the possibility of errors. So we already mentioned that sketch-based decoders help, help us uh, avoid grammatical errors, but there are still a few possibilities for errors. Uh, for example, we can have an aggregation function mismatch. And what that means is that, for example, if we try to apply the average function on a string type column, which is obviously uh, not possible to do, we're going to get an error and we're going to get a, a query that is not uh, executable. So execution guided decoding uh, helps us during prediction time by executing partially complete SQL queries. And if this partially complete query uh, returns an execution error or it yields empty results, this is an indication that the system has made uh, a bad prediction, so it informs the system about it and it tries to generate a different prediction that is going to be executable. Similarly, for sequence-based decoders, we have what is called constraint decoding. Uh, and we have here a system called Picard that uh, tries to tackle the, the main drawback of sequence-based decoders that can produce syntactic and grammatical errors. And what it does is uh, each time the, the model, the sequence-based decoder tries to predict uh, the next token in its output sequence, uh, Picard examines the top K uh, highest ranked tokens and if it uh, sees that any of these tokens uh, would result in a grammatical error, uh, if it would uh, create a, an incorrect uh, query syntactically, it is going to be discarded and it is only going to keep tokens that would result in a correct query. And additionally, if it sees that the system tries to generate a table or a column name that does not actually appear in the database, it is also going to be discarded. And in this way, we avoid a lot of errors. And we will see a bit more about it later on in the systems uh, section. Uh, the final output refinement technique that we will talk about is called discriminative re-ranking. And exactly because we're using neural networks, we can ask from the network to predict uh, more than one SQL queries. So, uh, instead of just taking the highest ranked prediction, we can ask the network to give us the four most likely predictions, for example, in its opinion. And what can happen uh, a lot of the time is that the network will predict the correct SQL query, but it will not be the highest ranked. So a system called uh, Global GNN proposes that we introduce uh, an additional model, an additional network that is going to be uh, a re-ranker for the main system's outputs. So what it does is it takes the K highest ranked predictions of the network, it re-ranks them based on uh, the inputs of the problem. And in this case, uh, maybe the, the right prediction was ranked number third by the, by the system, but our re-ranker has helped, uh, has helped us find that it is actually the correct one. And with this, we complete uh, this taxonomy of text to SQL systems. And now that we have gotten a very good grasp of how such a system is designed, we're going to take a closer look on some key text to SQL systems that have been proposed in the bibliography. We're going to start with sec to sql uh, this was uh, the first neural text to SQL system to be trained on a large benchmark. Uh, sec to sql works on the WikiSQL benchmark. It does not perform any kind of schema linking. It uses glove embeddings 
for natural language representation and it encodes uh, the inputs separately. So it has uh, an LSTM encoder for the natural language question and another uh, encoder for the table headers. And it uses three different networks to predict the SQL query. And uh, the big problem here is that the network that is tasked with predicting the where clause is a sequence based decoder, uh, which must predict the entire where clause. And this is what makes this network very prone to errors because this decoder, uh, this network must predict the correct structure and the correct order of these words. It must predict the correct names of the table columns, the correct operators, uh, and so on. Considering uh, neural training, this model is trained from scratch and it does not use any type of output refinement. Moving on, SQLnet uh, was a direct improvement to SEC to SQL. It was the first system to be completely sketch based and it achieved this by uh, dividing uh, the network that predicted the where clause into four different uh, sub networks. Uh, and each of these networks predicts a different part of the where clause. So, for example, uh, how many conditions we will have, which columns will appear in each condition, which operations, and which values. Uh, so, if we compare it, to a sec to sequel it is uh, almost identical with the big difference being in the output decoding dimension where now uh, we have a sketch based decoder uh, hydronet is another system that worked uh, on the wiki sql data set uh, it is also it also has a sketch based decoder uh, and the big difference here is that it almost completely relies uh, on BERT. Uh, so it uses BERT, it does not use word embeddings like the previous model. And what it does is that it uh, uses some very small uh, linear networks that make predictions for the text to SQL problem based on the contextualized outputs of BERT. So, uh, we will have again uh, a network for each part of the sketch. So we have a network that predicts the aggregation function, the select column, and so on. And as we mentioned earlier, what is very interesting about HydroNet is that it processes each column uh, separately. So it makes predictions for each column uh, separately. So it will decide for each column what probability we have that this column will appear in the select clause. And if it does, what kind of aggregation function it would use? What is the probability that this column appears in the where clause? And if it actually appears in the where clause, what kind of uh, condition we will apply to it? Uh, and so on. Uh, we will not go into depth about exactly how these predictions are made, but I would like to highlight uh, some differences uh, compared to the previous systems. Uh, the biggest difference is now that we have an encoder-only PLM and not word embeddings, which also means that we are now performing transfer learning and we're not training our model from scratch. And the input encoding is also different. Uh, and HydroNet uses this very unique approach of processing each column uh, separately. SQLOVA is another sketch-based system that works on WikiSQL. Uh, a big difference to HydroNet is that it serializes uh, the entire input and it encodes it uh, all at once. So we will have a sequence that starts with the classification token. Then we have the natural language question, uh, a separating token, and then we have all the tables of the column at once uh, in our sequence. This input sequence is given to BERT, which produces a contextualized representation of the input. And then 
SQL Lava uses uh, a much more complex network compared to HydraNet. Uh, as you can see, this, uh, this network is actually uh, almost identical to SQLNet. And uh, we have a different network that predicts uh, a different part of the uh, query sketch. What is also very interesting is that even though SQLOVA uh, has a much uh, larger network, it is a much heavier system, it actually achieves lower accuracy on WikiSQL uh, than HydraNet, which uh, does not have that complex networks besides BERT. And this might be an indication that when we're using a uh, pre-trained model, uh, it is wise to use it similarly to the way that it was pre-trained uh, and not just uh, replace it uh, instead of word embeddings uh, as is done here. Uh, if we compare SQLOVA to HydraNet, uh, the big difference uh, in the taxonomy is that now we're using uh, serialization for uh, input encoding. So all the systems we talked about this far uh, are designed for the WikiSQL benchmark. Now we're going to see a couple of systems that work on the SPIDER benchmark. IRNet is the first system we're going to talk about. Uh, as you have seen so far, none of the systems uh, have performed any type of schema linking. IRNet is one of the first systems to actually uh, try to tackle the schema linking uh, problem and introduce it in its framework. Uh, we'll start about we'll start talking about how IRNet performs schema linking. So what it does is it considers all n-grams of length from one to six in the question, uh, and if an n-gram matches a column or a table name uh, with a complete match or a partial match. Uh, we uh, keep this information. And if an engram appears inside quotes, it is marked to be a value link. Uh, so in this case, New York appears inside quotes. Uh, IRNet thinks that this is a value link. And like we talked about earlier, uh, IRNet assumes that we do not have access to the values of the database, maybe due to privacy issues. So what it does to, to find out what the, the column that this value link is referring to is that it searches the, the query candidate in a knowledge graph called ConceptNet. And ConceptNet tells us that New York is a state. And this allows us to link New York to the column born state like we saw earlier. So having found these schema links, uh, the NLQ is split into spans and uh, each span is assigned to the type of link that was discovered. So uh, the span New York is a value link, uh, the word department is a table link, and so on. Uh, IronNet uses BERT to encode uh, the input uh, using a serialization uh, approach. And in order uh, to mark that uh, to, to actually inform the system about the schema links that we have discovered. Uh, it appends some special tokens, like here, for example, uh, before the word department, we have the token, the schema link token table, which informs the system that here we have uh, a table link. And in order to create a single token representation for this, for each span, uh, it also processes BERT's output using uh, LSTM networks, and it processes each of these spans uh, with an LSTM to create a single hidden uh, representation. Similarly, uh, for each uh, column token, it uh, adds to each token a type embedding, uh, which adds extra information about the type of the column, if it is an integer, a string, uh, and so on. Finally, for the decoding part, uh, IRNet uses a grammar-based decoder, which generates SEMQL instead of SQL. And SEMQL is uh, an intermediate query language that was designed 
specifically for IronNet. And its authors argue that uh, using SendQL, they can uh, achieve better results. And it generates SendQL uh, as an abstract syntax tree using uh, an LSTM decoder, which uh, predicts a sequence of rules. And when we apply each of these rules sequentially, we can create an abstract syntax tree of SendQL, which then can be deterministically translated into SQL. Another interesting feature of IronNet is that when it tries to generate a column uh, or a table name, it can make a choice to make this prediction either from all the available elements of the database schema, or it can make this prediction out of elements that have already been generated uh, in this query. And this is very useful if we want to generate a token that reappears. So for example, in a, in a group by clause uh, or a where clause uh, and so on. And uh, moving on, we're going to see another very interesting system, which is called uh, RapSQL. Uh, the big difference to all the systems that we have seen so far is that RapSQL uses uh, a graph encoding approach. What it does is that it creates a question contextualized schema graph. What this means is that we have a schema graph that contains all the tables and all the columns of the database schema and all the information uh, of the schema, for example, which columns belong to which table, uh, which columns are connected with uh, primary and foreign key relations, and so on. And this schema graph is then contextualized with the natural language question that is given by the user. Uh, and this is done by adding each word of the NLQ uh, as a node in the graph, uh, as you see here on the right. And we can also uh, add information that has been discovered through schema linking in this graph uh, by connecting NLQ nodes to database schema nodes. So in this example, uh, we inform the system that we have a table link that was uh, discovered using uh, an exact match. Uh, now, encoding can be done either using GLOB or and the LSTM networks or by using uh, BERT. Uh, but, result, but experimental results show that when we use BERT, uh, we can achieve uh, better performance. And this is also true for the previous system uh, that we saw, IronNet. And the way that this is done is that first we serialize our graph, as you see here, and we give this sequence to BERT, uh, which produces uh, a contextualized representation of the nodes. Sorry. Uh, and then this uh, sequence is given to some specially modified transformer uh, networks, uh, which are called relation-aware self-attention uh, transformers, uh, which do not only accept this sequence, but they also accept information about uh, our graph's edges. And what they do is that they bias the network towards the already known relations that we have in the graph. So essentially, uh, the edges of the graph. So uh, by serializing the graph, we lost all this information about the relations, but we reintroduced this information through these uh, specifically modified transformers. And uh, by doing so, we create a very uh, strong and informative representation of the input, which can then be given to uh, an LSTM decoder that uh, is actually a grammar-based decoder that predicts uh, rules and it predicts uh, the SQL query as a abstract syntax tree, similarly to IronNet, but in this case, it, it generates SQL directly and not some intermediate language like uh, IronNet. Uh, the last system we will talk about is called Picard. Uh, 
Uh, we mentioned this earlier in the output refinement dimension. Uh, Picard is essentially uh, a constraining technique for autoregressive sequence decoders of language models. Uh, and as we mentioned earlier, sequence-based decoders are very prone to uh, syntax, grammar, and spelling errors. Um, so we will uh, look at exactly what Picard does uh, using this example. So the decoder would start by predicting the first token of the sequence. Let's say that it predicts the from token. And uh, starting from this token, it, it will have to generate the second token of the sequence. Let's say these are the three uh, highest ranked predictions of the decoder. Uh, now Picard would look at these uh, higher, highest ranked predictions uh, and it would uh, find out that uh, the middle one is actually incorrect because you can't have from and select next to each other. You have to actually uh, add some table here. So it would identify that this is incorrect syntactically and it would tell the uh, language model to discard this prediction and not look into it any further because this would result in uh, an incorrect query. So the model would then try to generate the third uh, token of the sequence. And here, uh, Picard sees that uh, the model tries to uh, add another attribute, but actually, this attribute is a column name and not a table name. And it would inform the model that uh, you cannot have a column name in the from clause. So this would result in an incorrect query. So you should discard this uh, prediction and look, not look into it any further. Similarly, it would go on. Uh, and in this case, the model would try to generate the column age in the select clause. And uh, Picard would look into it and it would realize that uh, the column age does not appear in any of the tables that you have already generated in the from clause. So this would also result in a query uh, that is not going to be executable, that it would return an error. So it tells the system that you should actually uh, discard this option because it is not going to make uh, a good prediction. So using such techniques, uh, Picard tackles all the drawbacks of sequence-based decoders. And uh, actually, it manages to reach the top of the spider leaderboard in, in combination with a very strong uh, encoder-decoder pre-trained language model uh, called T5, uh, and specifically the, the version of T5 that has 3 billion parameters. So we're talking about a very, very large model here. So uh, to sum it up, uh, we have seen systems that work both on uh, the WikiSQL benchmark and the SPIDER benchmark. Uh, first of all, on the dimension of NL representation, the first systems we looked at used GLOVE word embeddings. But as we saw, since the introduction of pre-trained language models, um, they have been the go-to uh, choice for natural language representation, uh, mainly due to their uh, performance boost. Uh, in the schema linking dimension, we saw that all the systems that work on the WikiSQL benchmark do not perform uh, any kind of schema linking. There are actually some systems that work on the WikiSQL benchmark that do some schema linking. Uh, but maybe we could argue that since this benchmark is so simple and since we only have tables and not databases, maybe it's not that necessary. Uh, some of the systems that we saw for SPIDER actually perform schema linking, but the last one, the best performing one, does not do any type of schema linking. So uh, there are two questions, two possibilities here. Maybe. Uh, if we have a very strong model, we do not need to do schema linking and the model can figure it out by itself. Or maybe if we find a way to introduce schema linking to this model, we can achieve even better results. On the dimension of input encoding, uh, the first models we saw used separate encoding 
mainly because of uh, because they were using Glove and LSTM networks. Uh, we also saw uh, an example, a very unique example, where HydraNet processes each column uh, separately. But besides that, uh, most systems use the serialization technique, which is very useful uh, with pre-trained language models, with the exception of RATSQL that uses a very promising uh, graph encoding technique. Finally, in the decoder output dimension, uh, we saw that sec to sql was the first system that used uh, sequence-based decoding, but uh, after that, most systems uh, kept away from sequence-based decoding, and we saw that uh, systems that work on WikiSQL uh, prefer sketch-based decoding, and systems that work on Spider prefer grammar-based decoding because it can generate much more complex queries. And uh, finally, we saw uh, Picard, which made the, the use of sequence-based decoders possible once again uh, through its uh, constrained decoding uh, technique. And maybe this is an indication that uh, sequence-based decoders might be more powerful than we thought. And maybe there's uh, a lot of room for research uh, in this direction. So I will now hand it over to Georgia, who will talk about challenges and very interesting research opportunities uh, in this domain. Okay, so in the last hour, we talked about different uh, text to SQL systems, and we started our discussion talking about the need to enable users to ask questions in natural language over different data sets. And uh, this is essentially uh, dictated by the need for data democratization, essentially for enabling any type of user, not necessarily IT experts, to be able to ask questions, to leverage data, and to uh, to use them in uh, in different settings and for different applications. So if we look at the text to SQL problem, essentially is a translation problem, taking a natural language question and translating to an SQL query. Uh, SQL is the underlying uh, system language for for the systems that we are talking about here. Uh, looking at the, uh, looking at the problem as a neural machine translation problem, essentially that gives us the uh, opportunity to use different deep learning techniques for uh, uh, for uh, solving this problem. And in the last hour, we saw a taxonomy of these systems, as well as many representative examples of different uh, systems that use different deep learning techniques. And in the last slide, we also saw. Uh, a very nice uh, 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 slide comparing the, the different approaches. Now, the question here that uh, we want to ask ourselves at this point is, okay, how far we have gone and what challenges and also research opportunities lie ahead of us. So if we take a look at existing benchmark, benchmarks as well as existing systems, uh, a main pain point here is that uh, they focus on effectiveness. Essentially effectiveness here means how many queries the system is able to translate. So we see uh, the leaderboards in, uh, on, the wiki on the wiki benchmark or the spider benchmark, they all give essentially one number that measures this, uh, this, this performance. However, the text to SQL problem has multiple different uh, aspects that need to be considered at the same time. For example, the uh, the query expressivity, the types and different categories of queries, both from an NL and an SQL standpoint, that the system is able to, to understand. For example, in SPIDER, we only see four very coarse grain categories, from easy to extra hard. But this essentially do not allow us to understand what type of uh, SQL queries or what type of different NL challenges a particular system can deal with. Furthermore, existing benchmarks and existing systems do not focus so much on execution time. It is important, however, to uh, deal with this aspect as well because translation essentially creates an overhead 
over the whole experience that the user has. And uh, earlier approaches that didn't use deep learning techniques essentially were also trying to figure out the best SQL query that could be uh, optimally uh, executed over the database and return the results very fast to the user. This aspect has been overlooked greatly by uh, recent deep learning techniques, but uh, th that, is, uh, that is an important aspect to be uh, addressed. Also the size of the model. So uh, the examples that we saw earlier, for example, RAT SQL or even T5, uh, actually have um, uh, trained very large models. And the question here is whether these models are always appropriate for any type of uh, different domains and applications or whether uh, in, in particular cases, they may be very hard to use. Another aspect here is that these uh, benchmarks essentially assume that there is only one way to say uh, what the user needs in SQL. The truth is that there are different equivalent SQL queries returning the same answer. And this is, uh, this is another aspect that has been overlooked by uh, current systems as well as current benchmarks. Uh, towards the direction of understanding a little bit better the, the query expressivity of existing systems, one recent benchmark was uh, Thor that um, uh, that includes keyword and natural language queries that are divided now into 17 different categories. And these categories here span and cover different SQL challenges. So different types of SQL queries that the system should be able to handle as well as different natural language challenges. For example, whether there are synonyms, whether there are misspellings, whether we see uh, uh, queries that have inference uh, issues and things like that. And uh, dealing with uh, using this benchmark to uh, measure the performance of uh, different systems, uh, we found out that one of the biggest challenges that we are still have to, to handle is, is query expressivity. Essentially, few systems, as, uh, as you can see here, have the, this uh, green um, categorization are able to tackle most of the SQL challenges. As we go down to natural language challenges, things are getting uh, harder and uh, we see that more systems do not uh, operate that well. Obviously, we need more ways to better understand query expressivity for each different system. And that will allow us to be able to understand where we need to focus our attention and whether we need to combine different um, good parts, if you like, from different systems that could solve some of these problems. So can we really build systems that can answer any type of natural language question? This is an open question. Now, another problem is that we do not see systems that can actually work for equally well for different uh, data sets. Even in the case of the uh, Thor benchmark that I uh, talked about earlier, where we used uh, three uh, relatively simple data sets, IMDB, Yelp, and the Microsoft Academic Search data set, the, uh, the, the systems that we uh, tested there exhibited different behavior across these different data sets. And in fact, that is why we see in the in industry solutions using uh, domain specific uh, uh, systems that for example, use ontologies or knowledge bases in order to be able to operate well in a specific domain, for example, sales or finance. So can we build, can we really have systems that can operate equally well uh, over different data sets? This is again, an open question. And if we go to real life uh, data sets, for example, astrophysics like SDSS data set or the cancer biomarker research, things are getting even uglier there. And uh, what we have observed is that essentially even the top systems right now for the SPIDER benchmark do not work uh, in, in these real life uh, cases. And let us see why this is happening. There are a number of different and very critical reasons. First of all, is that many of these uh, data sets actually have unknown and sometimes cryptic schemas. For example, uh, the SDSS, the, this astrophysics uh, database, has uh, tables and attributes with names like UG, SpecOpt. These are names that 
any of these existing uh, text to SQL systems that we have seen, uh, they, they don't know. They have not seen these, uh, uh, these names before when they were trained, and that creates a problem. The second problem here is how we can scale to very large schemas. Again, I, I will refer to the SDSS database. We have uh, a single table like photo ops may have over 500 attributes. In this may create problems because some of these systems have particular ways of how they accept input in uh, the how they accept input in, uh, in in the system and how they combine the natural language question with the underlying schema information in order to to translate uh, the question dealing with very large schemas may actually create an obstacle to these uh, systems and of course as we already mentioned before some of the systems are very complex and uh, the question that we often deal with is whether we can actually use them in practice in, in, uh, in real life um, uh, use cases. And the last problem that I would like to refer when we are dealing with uh, such uh, data set is of course that we don't have training data and the benchmarks like SPIDER or WikiSQL of course do not cover these, uh, these particular data sets. And of course, all the discussion here has been around deep learning and all the, the, the systems here that we presented focus on deep learning uh, techniques. Uh, earlier systems, however, used uh, approaches that were more database oriented. And these approaches actually tended to uh, generate semantically correct SQL queries. Now, the question here, and this is actually a trend that we have seen in the very recent uh, text to SQL systems, is whether we can combine such approaches to achieve the best of both worlds. Essentially, database approaches will bring us in information that uh, the database can provide, for example, the schema, the connections, the values, the, uh, the allowed, the acceptable SQL queries. On the other hand, neural machine translation approaches allow us to generalize to different types of queries. So how can we actually make this work together and achieve better results? A ton of different uh, challenges still exist. For example, for the same query, we may have different ways to answer the query. A simple example here would be show me Italian restaurants. And it could be that we, we refer to restaurants that are that are also categorized as Italian or restaurants that also serve Italian food. And both of these ways are actually um, uh, good ways to answer the same question. Even if we say that we solve the text to SQL problem, we still have a lot of steps, a lot of problems to solve in order to achieve data democratization as we, uh, as we discussed at the beginning of, of this uh, lecture. For example, how can the user validate that the predicted SQL query, that the, the, the SQL query that the system understood actually matches the intention of the user query? So here, essentially, we're talking about natural language explanations of SQL, essentially the SQL to text problem. What if the user does not understand database? We already said that databases nowadays are, are complex and users may not be um, may not uh, be very well familiar with this, uh, uh, with the database schemas. Query accommodations, intelligent exploration systems are needed here. And what if the user does not understand the return data? So we need data visualization techniques, we need query result explanations. So essentially, all these are different pieces of the same uh, puzzle, the data democratization puzzle. And text to SQL systems essentially are just one of the pieces in, in, in the big picture. So at this point, I would like to thank you for your attention and uh, we uh, would like to answer any questions that you may have. Okay, so George, I think there are no uh, questions. So maybe we can conclude uh, this uh, session and uh, thank you once more for, uh, for uh, participating in this uh, tutorial.